Hello, class. Um, this is a lecture on, uh, actually it's gonna be on, uh, you know, sort of finishing out the uh, banking and turning. And I just wanna look at two very simple little problems there um, that are, are, are two interesting problems that I made up. And then I wanna get into uh, our real, um, understanding, and we sort of looked at a little projectile motion when we were looking at uh, one-dimensional rectilinear motion, uh, but I want to get into a, uh, a similar thing about a uh, projectile motion uh, problem. Then I want to go into a uh, more or less uh, a, a realistic problem about trying to find out um, constant acceleration. So we'd be looking at something like a, a rocket, so that the rocket would have a constant acceleration. I've actually given the rocket somewhere around uh, 3G constant acceleration. And um, for the space shuttle, that's what they did. They would throttle back to make sure that they maintained a 3G uh, unless they had to go out to the you know Hubble Space Telescope or something like that. So those are the, the things that I wanna look at uh, in this lecture. And like I say, it's really just finishing off, uh, turning, banking, uh, centrifugal force, centripetal acceleration, all of those things. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to look at, so let's, uh, let's say that we're gonna have uh, centrifugal force. So we're gonna sort of finish that off. And we're also then going to get into uh, a two-dimensional projectile motion. I'll leave three-dimensional projectile motion for your graduate school. And uh, a lot of you have already, you know, in your physics and everything sort of done this. So this is sort of just uh, doing some ex example problems uh, to sort of cement in your understanding, your learning of um, some centripetal acceleration and centrifugal force. So I'm gonna look at a, at a bicyclist. And so let's say that I've got, uh, they're at the Olympics and I've got a bicyclist. Uh, I'm gonna to try to draw a bicyclist that is on a bike, right? And, and everybody realizes that at the Olympics, those bicyclists are really riding on there. And in fact, I should have put the bicyclist sort of turn pointing out because of course that's what they're doing. And, and we all know that that is a relatively large bank for them. And of course that's because the radius of curvature is so small. So we're going to the Olympics. I'm saying that the radius of curvature of that bike track is going to be 100 feet. We could work in uh, um, meters and stuff, uh, but I, I'm, Everybody knows how to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to try these a little bit. Let's say that the velocity of the bicyclist is 60 miles per hour. And by now you should have memorized that 60 miles per hour is 80 feet per second. So we don't have to really go through uh, the conversion to do that. Now, if he's gonna be going 60 miles an hour around a 100 foot radius of curvature, uh, how much should we bank that? And again, this really is a one line problem because that's just the inverse tangent. And let's uh, just write out our thing. We've already derived this. Uh, so I'll just write it down, V squared over GR. And I'll refer you to the previous lectures um, if you uh, don't know where that came from. Now let's plug in some of those numbers. So I've got the inverse tangent. Uh, I'm gonna use 88 feet per second. I'm gonna square that. Divided by 32.17 feet per second squared. All right, we've all memorized that now. I'll put that ex out, out a little bit. And then R is just going to be 100 feet. So I don't really have to change anything there. And then I want to take the square root of that, don't I? So theta 
is going to be the inverse tangent of that. And I'm just going to punch those in again because I want to make sure that, um, you know, I did it right the first time, <laughs> but uh, 88 squared divided by 32.17 feet per second squared divided by 100 feet for the radius of curvature taken to the square root gives me Oh, am I back in, uh, oh, wait a second. Yeah, uh, no, that's right. And then my uh, inverse tangent, and I get 57.19. Let me just do that. Oh, I forgot to take the square root, maybe, no, just a second. Oh, uh, no, wait. Why exactly, again, am I taking that, uh, let's see, do, do, do. I'm not taking the square root of that. Right. And I don't think I did actually uh, in this either. So let me just do this again. 88 squared divided by 32.17 divided by 100 equals. Um, Inverse tangent, that's right, 67.44. Sorry about that, I don't know where I got the idea that I was supposed to take. It's a good thing I catch these before I actually put these lectures out. That's right. In class I would catch it too, or you would catch it and you would mention it to me or something because we're all working along at the same time. So 67.44 degrees is what I should make my Olympic uh, bicycle uh, track, right? I'm just gonna cut that section out so that we can go on to the, the next section. And this is a little more complicated, the solution of this problem. What I'm saying is uh, I, I, I've got an asteroid, right? Now, now we know a couple things about asteroids. Asteroids, the density of an asteroid, because asteroids are pretty much um, steel. I say steel, but I really mean iron. And what is a, a, an iron asteroid? It's a leftover, isn't it? An iron asteroid is a leftover from a supernova. Actually, it could be just a regular nova. But uh, gold and the higher order elements, platinum, gold, those come from supernovas. But uh, things like steel come from just regular novas, um, and they are made by, the, by suns, right? Okay, so anyway, uh, if we're looking at an asteroid, an asteroid's density is about 5850 kilograms per cubic meter. And think of how big a cubic meter is, right? A cubic meter, that's pretty, pretty big. And if I had uh, steel or iron, that was a cubic meter, it would weigh about 58, 50 kilograms, a little more, little more or less, uh, give or take, but that's what it is. So I know that that is the density of the asteroid. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the asteroid, I'm not sure how big the asteroid is, but I do know what the gravitational attraction of that asteroid is. Right, because I, I've sent a probe over there and I know what the, what the a, a gravitational attraction is of that probe right around the surface of the asteroid. And I know that that would be the gravitational attraction of the Earth divided by 50. So it's 1 50th the gravitational attraction uh, of the Earth. And in fact, we could just use that number, 9.81, you know, or in this case, uh, yeah, 9.81 divided by uh, 50. Right, so 9.81 divided by 50 gives me 0.1962, sorry, uh, meters per second squared. So now we know what the gravitational attraction of that uh, asteroid is, right? We've sent our probe, our, our, our robot satellite out there to look at it. We know what the density of it is because we can see that it's really a steel um, thing. And what we want to do is we want to send a lander down to land and to move around. It's got a little rover, right? 
It's like uh, an RC car, right? But it's a really a rover, like we put on uh, the moon, or I mean on Mars, those rovers that rove around Mars. So that's what we're doing is, is we're putting, we wanna put a little rover on this thing, but we don't want it to drive off. So we wanna make sure that it doesn't go too fast to drive off and, and get into orbit around this asteroid. You know, we also don't know how actually big the radius of this uh, asteroid is, right? But we know what its gravitational attraction is. We also know how to find out if we know what the density is, we could figure out what um, is going to give us this type of gravitational uh, attraction, right? So uh, if we look at the equation, we know that R is gonna equal V squared over G, right? So I've got V of course equals, uh, um, well, I think everybody knows V squared, uh, V equals the square root of RG. So of course, if that's the case, then this is going to be our relationship really. Uh, v squared over G equals the, the radius of curvature. Um, but we also know what G equals, don't we? So if I have, uh, if I'm looking at Newton's gravitational attraction, right? So the force of, of Newton's gravitational attraction is G times M times small m. Small m is the same thing we use for mg or mv squared over r, right? Divided by the distance squared. So that's our gravitational attraction and uh, our force. And if we wanted our gravitational attraction, that would just be G m over r squared, right? G M over R squared. And we know what G is because G, if we were to solve this for G, that would just be V squared over R, right? So we know that V squared over R equals G and we also know that G equals Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the asteroid. Let me just put that down there, right? Because we're talking about the, the asteroid. We've already gotten rid of the M because we're just looking at G now, right? Uh, divided by R, and I, I'll make it small r so that we use the same variable in both of those. I mean, it's a capital R, but the, the Rs are both exactly the same R, so, so that doesn't matter. Right. We also know a couple more things about the mass of that asteroid. Isn't it the uh, volume of the asteroid? Let's assume that it's spherical, right? So we know a couple things. So G equals 6.67 .6 times 10 to the minus 11 meters cubed over kilogram seconds squared. So that's our, our Newton's gravitational attraction. We know what that is. We know what MA is, don't we? Because we know that the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. You know, if I take the mass, <clears throat> if I take the volume and I multiply it by the uh, density, isn't that going to give me the mass? So let's put that in there. So we've got Newton's gravitational constant. Then we've got the volume times the density. So I'm just going to put a little thing there. So the volume is going to be four thirds pi r cubed times the density, right? Oh, well, that's supposed to be rho. All of that divided by r squared. All right. And the, so this is going to be my velocity to orbit. So that's what we want to do. We want to find out our, our velocity uh, to orbit. And of course, we want to find out what the radius is too, right? Because we want to find out what, what that radius uh, is going to be. So I uh, 
I find uh, R, let me just solve this um, for R. We still have G over here. Let's not forget G. So um, I can rewrite this. Let me just rewrite this so that it uh, is easier for everybody to see where all the numbers are going to come from. So G times 4 over 3 times uh, r squared, right? Now we still got r squared, so pi times r cubed times rho. Now, r squared is going to cancel out with all but one of those, isn't it? Does everybody see that? We've still got v squared uh, over R on the other side, too. So that R, let's see, where, where are we? Do, 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 do. Yeah, for some reason, it seems like I have another R that cancels out here. G, no, no, that's fine. Yep, I've got it. Okay. So we're trying to find R, and of course, R, we've got... Uh, Have I got that right? G equals G M I yeah, V squared. I could put that there and then that would give me R squared. You know, I can, uh, I, I can solve this. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna find R first. So we've got G of A. So let's just find out what R has to equal for it to work in, in this situation. So we know that R, since uh, R is on top here, this is gonna be three times G. So three times G sub A is in the numerator. What's in the denominator? Well, capital G times four times pi uh, times rho. And all that's going to equal what R is. And if I plug all of those in, let me, let me just, uh, I mean, I should, I, I, you know, 6.6, I don't want to write that down. 4 pi rho, um, 5850 kilograms per meter cube. And then G sub A is 0.196. Uh, why don't I write all this? 3 times 0.1962 meters per second squared divided by, uh, I'm just gonna use G if you don't mind, times four, times pi, times, I'll write this out, 5850 kilograms per meter. All right, I'm hoping this comes down to <laughs> what I think it does. Six, seven, exponent minus 11, divided by four, divided by pi, divided by 5850 uh, 50 equals, that is not, <laughs> that is not what I, I thought it would come out to. I just want to check this for a second. I'll be right back, but I, I must have made, yeah, it just took me a second. No, I, I've done everything uh, correct, as a matter of fact, and what this did come out to is uh, exactly right. I was just not interpreting it correctly. Uh, so three times 0.1962 divided by 6.67 exponent minus 11 divided by four divided by pi divided by 58.50 equals 120,040 meters, right? So I've got uh, 120 kilometers, approximately. So that's what the radius, that's the radius of the asteroid. So the diameter of the asteroid would be about 240 kilometers right so we're talking about something that's uh, that's a good size 
asteroids, so uh, maybe not as big as Cirrus, but you know something that's relatively large. So that equals R of the asteroid, right? If we wanted to look at that in miles, you, you can do the, the transformation, but it comes out to around 73.8 miles, right? Somewhere around there. It's a planet killer. So those 73.8 miles, if it was coming here at 40,000 miles an hour, it would punch right through our crust and then it would allow the internal molten um, magma to spew out hundreds of miles into the sky and then rain down on us. So if you enjoy having hot molten lava rain down on you, I uh, join the dinosaurs. Because <laughs> we, we, in fact, the dinosaur killer was much smaller than the 73.8 miles that I have right here. Maybe that's why all intelligent civilizations uh, die because uh, some small group goes, gets an asteroid and brings it back home and it falls <laughs> into the earth and everyone dies. So that, you know, could possibly be that. Now that we still haven't figured out what is the, the fastest that that rover could actually move, right? On the surface without going into orbit. That's what I wanted to find out from the very beginning. We now know what R is. So let's figure out what uh, the velocity is. And so the velocity is just going to be equal to R, and we know we're gonna be on the surface, so that's going to be uh, um, 120,040 meters, right? We'll do this in meters per second, then we can change it. And uh, so that's, that's our uh, uh, radius to the surface. And then we also have to have our gravitational attraction and our gravitational attraction is 0 0.1962 uh, meters per second squared. We did all of this in the SI system. So again, everything works out fine. 120,040 times 0 0.1962 equals, taken to the square root, gives me one, hundred and fifty three meters per second. Now it's actually 153.4, but you know we probably lost that in all the calculations that we've done anyway. 153 meters per second. Well how fast is that in miles per hour? Well we have to divide by 1609 meters right, per mile, and we have to multiply by 3,600 seconds in an hour, and that gives us 300, no, yeah, this, that does not seem right. Just a second, I've got to check something here. Hi class, uh, you know, I'm back, I, I checked and uh, yep, everything's right, so uh, I don't have to worry about that. And let's see, I'm in meters, yep, meters per second, meters squared, second squared, taking the square root, give me 153 point uh, meters uh, per second. Um, and times, gives me about 340 miles per hour. So we don't really have to worry about that rover roving too far around on Ceres. Uh, you know, it's, it would be interesting to actually find out how uh, big Ceres actually is. I'm going to give myself a few more minutes uh, there because um, I, uh, I did that pause. So. Uh, I've got about 10 more minutes left in this lecture, and I'm so glad that I figured all of that out and I was actually off uh, by the other one. I, I don't know if I forgot to square, take the square or the square root or whatever, but everything seems to be working fine. All right. Uh, so we've got those two out of the way, and what I want to do now is I want to look or at least set up a problem. I don't know if I'll be able to get through the whole problem. It is a very complicated problem. But it's, uh, it's a rocket that's taking off, all right? Rocket that's taking off, think of the space shuttle, think of the Saturn V, uh, these are very close. So it's acceleration, right? It's not just a, a 
gun, you know, a bullet coming out of a gun or a cannonball coming out of a cannon. A rocket accelerates once it leaves the muzzle, right? So it's leaving the ground, it's still accelerating. And this is what I wanna look at, is this is a constant acceleration. And it's a constant acceleration that is 100 feet per second squared. And you're thinking, well, that's about three Gs, right? That's about three G's worth of power. And that's gonna go for how long? It actually turns out that it's about two and a half minutes uh, for it to actually get to orbit if it, if it does go at three G's. If it goes higher, uh, you know, like 10 G's or whatever, obviously that's gonna be less time to get to orbit. But, um, but right now we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, it's gonna level itself out at three Gs, that's what its uh, acceleration is going to be. No matter if it's losing all of its fuel, like the space shuttle, uh, it's still gonna constantly be throttling back to make sure that it's uh, three Gs. We know a couple other things too. We know that it's going to be going 20,000 miles per hour when it reaches its orbit. That orbit's gonna be, you know, couple hundred miles. Uh, in fact, its orbit is going to be 200 miles above the Earth. So that's what we want its orbit to be, 200 miles above the Earth. Uh, and what we want to look at now is when, when the rocket first goes up, let's say that this is my rocket, right? Now, as the rocket first goes up, it tends to lean over a little bit. And why does a rocket do that? It, it does it because uh, the rest of, just like when I'm firing off a, uh, a projectile, right? The projectile leaves the muzzle of the gun, and then it just goes and flies on the parabola because it still has that force pulling it down, right? So does a rocket. A rocket has a force pulling it down as it starts to go up, its force is pulling it down. And so what you see is if even the rocket is off a little bit, that rocket is eventually going to um, level out at a certain thing. So we know it's gonna level out at 200 miles. And, um, and it's gonna be going 20,000 miles per hour at that 200 miles. So I wanna write a couple things here. So S, why? I want to break these down into their two orthogonal components, one in the x direction, one in the y direction, and those are at 90 degrees to each other, so they're totally independent of one another. So I know when Sy equals 200 miles, right? That's the final height, 200 miles, and it's in the y direction. Do we have any original distance uh, S sub zero times, uh, no. So we have zero meters. How about original velocity? No, we have zero meters uh, per second times time, so we don't have to worry about that. How about um, my acceleration, right? Well, let's say plus, and now I'm gonna put a bracket here because there's two types of acceleration, right? In fact, what I should do is I should put a, uh, well, I can put the one half at the end. Let's just do the numerator, uh, not the denominator. So I'll put the one half at the end. So I've got A, whatever my acceleration is from the rocket, times the sine of whatever the angle is we decide to, to take off at, right? Because that's going to be what happens in the beginning. We're, we're slightly, uh, in fact, when a rocket takes off, it's not slightly inclined at all, is it? No, but once it does take off, you and the space shuttle probably did this better than any, it starts to lean over. So once it takes off vertical, as soon as it clears the tower and everything, you start to see it lean to its anticipated and projected angle. And that's the angle that we're gonna be finding out here. It's very close to vertical. It's very close to vertical, so uh, that's why, you know, a lot of people probably think it is vertical, but in, in fact, it's not. Now, let's, uh, there it is. So let's go back and finish off our, our thing here. So A sine theta minus, let's not forget the gravitational constant, right? So minus uh, G 
I'll just put G because we're going to assume that it's of the earth. Uh, I'll put small e there. So G of the earth, right? And then that's going to be times T squared divided by two. I just put that in there. So we know that's 200. So that's our first equation that we have. The second equation we have is looking at the velocity in the x direction, and the x direction would be the orbital direction, right? So we know that once we get up there, we're gonna be going 20,000 uh, miles per hour. And we, we should want to find out what 20,000 uh, miles per hour actually is. Uh, I think I have that written down someplace. Uh, we'll figure that out in a little while. Anyway, let's uh, just do that equation. So I know that I have uh, 20,000 miles per hour. That's the velocity in the x direction. And how, that's my final velocity in the x direction, by the way. And how did I uh, uh, get to that point? Um, well, there is no V zero T, right? So the only thing that I have that gets, that, that is accelerating me in that direction is one half uh, times A Wait a second, what have I got here? V2, you know, this is not the, the Vx equals, oh, wait a second, I'm, I'm mixing equations here, just a second. Okay, class, I, I am back, and I did check on a couple things, uh, I actually did, uh, make a mistake. It's a, very, a relatively complicated problem. I, I've run out of time too, so I want to, uh, I'm going to, to put down some things here that uh, will save us a little time. So this is 29,333 feet per second, right? That's what the 20,000 miles per hour is um, in um, feet per second. So I've got that. And then I know that that's going to be my original velocity, which is zero, right? Plus uh, one half times my acceleration in that direction, which is 100 feet per second squared times the cosine, right? Because we're going in the x direction now. So it's the cosine of theta. And so I have this equation right here. This is one of, that's one of my equations. And this is the second one of my equations. So you can see that in this equation, I now have everything. Oops, you know what I forgot? I forgot T, didn't I? Yep. Let's not forget our T. So we've got T there and we've got T squared over two, but it doesn't matter, T squared here. And so what I can do is I can equate these two um, equations for t squared. And that's what I want to do. If I, was, uh, if I was looking at t squared, let's just do the top one first. You can see I've got the 200 miles, and I'll tell you what two, 200 miles equals 1.056 times 10 to the 6 feet. All right. I'm going to get a little better uh, pen here, a nicer and newer one. Okay, so we've got t squared, and if we want to put it in uh, this, it's going to be the uh, 1.056 times 2, right? So that's t squared. So 2 times my 200 miles, which is 1.056 times 10 to the 6 uh, feet, right? So I've got 2 times that, then... Uh, I'm going to divide it by a sine theta. So divide this by 100 feet per second squared. Did I say this was a better one? I lied. Uh, <laughs> I could probably find a better one. But anyway, uh, the, the acceleration uh, times the sine of theta, right? Minus g of the earth. 
So we've got everything in there, and of course that equals T2. And if we wanted to equate that to T2 down here, well, I think everybody can see that I'm going to take the two and multiply it by that. 29,333 feet per second. Yeah, let me try a brand new one. Um, so you can see why I've got that. I'm gonna square it in a second, but uh, you've got that. And then I'm, uh, let me see, where did I get that? Oh yeah, there's the two. Two times the 29,333 uh, and then divided by 100 feet per second squared and divided by the cosine uh, of theta. Now I wanna square that whole thing, don't I? So I'm gonna square that because that's in terms of T, right? So two and then this divided by a cosine. So this is gonna end up being squared on the bottom. So this, I'm just gonna make these, point these out. This and this are equal to one another, right? Those are equal to one another. So if I actually wanted to solve this, what I end up getting in the end, I hope I did this right, was the sine of theta divided by the square of the cosine of theta equals 2.2456. And that tells us that theta equals 13.44 degrees. And so you can see once we, once we leave the tower, we're starting to lean over aren't we? We're starting to lean that over so that we can get up to that height. All right, that, uh, that's holding it for, for this uh, one. In fact, I probably did a little too, bit too much. All right, see you later. See you at the next lecture.